The character of Hecuba in Euripides' The Women of Troy, a podcast by Dr. Daryl Barclay. Euripides' confronting play, The Women of Troy, presents its audience with a range of innovations and dramaturgical devices to amplify the emotional intensity of a work in which action is largely replaced by impact. Undergirding the play's structural design is the character of Hecuba, whose personal journey and her reactions to it assert Euripides' authorial agenda with striking resonance and relentless insistence. Whether commanding and regal, or vulnerable and desperate, she remains the play's backbone, dominating a stage from which she is never absent. For the audience, Hecuba is past, present and future. She tells us about her personal losses and the destruction of Troy. She invites us into the agony of her traumatic present, the one she shares with her Trojan sisters. And she foreshadows for herself and the women whom she is leading a fearful future of debasement and domestic and sexual slavery. Euripides' immediate concern as a dramatist is to craft the audience's sustained moment of encounter with Hecuba and the Trojan women as they are during those several hours on stage, confused, disoriented, traumatised and disempowered refugees. However, for the play to work as theatre, Euripides has also to exploit its conceptual tritemporality, that is, its ideas, themes and narratives about past, present and future. All these elements provide the necessary context for the drama of the play's live moment, the point at which an audience connects in a visceral way through the women with a much larger reality. Hecuba herself reminds the audience of this temporal framework in episode one. What I am suffering and have suffered, what I will suffer yet, is more than enough to make anyone fall and never get up again. The details of this context were not new to Euripides' mythologically literate audience. In the 5th century BC, the epic narrative of the Trojan War and its catastrophic aftermath loomed large in the Athenian consciousness, as it continues to do even to this day. But beyond the specific details, Euripides is aiming for immediate theatrical impact at a human level. It is also important to remember that in this play, past, present and future are intimately interrelated and depend on each other to create in the end a unified effect. We will look at each of these three key elements individually, but always on the understanding that each one is inseparable from the other two. So let's look now at the ways in which the past is invoked in contextualizing the play's compelling present. As the action is set in the aftermath of war, and it is clearly not Euripides' intention to dramatize on stage a 10 year long conflict, it is still important for the impact of the Greek assault on Troy to be foregrounded for the audience. The first mention of Troy's singular status is found in the Prologos during Poseidon's Rhesus, when he emphasizes that he and Apollo built the city which now lies in ruins. I built this city, with Apollo I built it. Every stone we laid, every tower, even the walls we dressed and leveled with plumb line and mason's square. Troy's origins, therefore, result from a divine partnership. For Poseidon, Troy's destruction is disastrous for the city itself, but also because he will no longer be venerated, since the temples in his honour have also been destroyed. He establishes for the audience the irrefutable fact that nothing is left of the city's former greatness. And look at it now, a smoking ruin, devastated by the power of the Greek war machine. In addition to its physical stature, however, Troy has also become great due to its people, heroes, culture and geopolitical power. Hecuba's deep love for all that Troy represents is evidenced by the intensity of her lamentation and her laudatory descriptions of the city. In the play's final moments, she exclaims, quote, Troy, 
While you lived, you were the greatest and most glorious of all the cities of Asia. Unquote. The Trojans' losses are all the more traumatic because they stand in stark contrast to the many stunning achievements of their city and its heroic figures. Hecuba sums up the total annihilation of Troy when she exclaims in the first few lines of her monody that, quote, Troy has ceased to exist, unquote. Beyond this foundational recognition of Trojan exceptionalism, however, and the subsequent destruction of its extraordinary legacy, there emerges a deeper and more personal pain for which Hecuba becomes the chief conduit. Because Euripides knows that the audience is already familiar with Hecuba's losses prior to the action of the play, he first deals with them in a very economical way by having Hecuba summarise them neatly in three direct and succinct lines early in her opening monody. Oh, weep, weep for my burning home, howl for my children dead, for my husband dead, the boast of my noble family, empty as a sail when the winds fail. However, in order to sustain the emotional impact of these losses, Euripides plants further such moments throughout the play, never allowing the audience to forget past atrocities or the Trojan Queen's particular losses. Late in episode one, following Cassandra's departure from the stage, Hecuba narrates in graphic detail the slaughter of her own sons at the hands of the Greeks. And I saw every one of them slaughtered by the swords and spears of the Greeks. By their open graves I have stood and cut my hair in mourning to cast upon their bodies. And so many bitter tears I have wept for their father Priam. Here, Euripides takes the further opportunity of emphasizing the scandal of regicide, joining the murder of King Priam, Hecuba's husband, to the desecration of Troy's holiest precinct. With my own eyes I saw him hacked down on the altar steps of our holiest temple, and the whole city sacked as the Greeks ran riot. It is at this point that we also learn from Hecuba about the manner in which the other women were taken captive and forced into their present moment of misery. All the daughters I brought up with such care to make them fit brides for princes, I saw them snatched from my arms, their good breeding wasted on brutal soldiery and foreigners. All of these analepses from Hecuba allow Euripides to exploit the epic, graphic and vivid details of an established narrative tradition merely by referring to them, as opposed to having to dramatise them on the stage. In this way, he establishes a rock-solid foundation for what he actually will show on stage in the immediate plight of the Trojan women. We'll turn at this point to consider how Euripides handles the concept of the present in his play. From the outset, Hecuba's new reality is conveyed very obviously and very visually to the audience. It is achieved mimetically, that is, shown to us rather than explained to us in words, as she lies prostrate in the dust while Poseidon and Athene enact their conspiracy. In her opening monody, following the departure of the two gods, she uses the adverb now three times, stressing the confronting nature of the moment in which she finds herself, as well as the stark contrast between it and her royal past. Look at me now, throned in the dust by Agamemnon's tent flap, an old woman dragged as a slave from my home, all hope plundered from my God-cursed ravaged grey head. One of Hecuba's key roles in the play is to channel and express corporate grief on behalf of Troy and most directly the women in her care. The semantic field of lamentation which Euripides establishes through a range of imperatives such as howl, weep, grieve and cry is initiated and sustained by Hecuba throughout the play and echoed by the female chorus. The onomatopoeic howling, sometimes expressed through phatic exclamatives, connotes pain at an animal level as if it is no longer humanly possible to express it otherwise. As the chorus pointedly exclaims, quote, 
What howling can give tongue to a pain no animal could endure? Unquote. Though Hecuba and her female subjects are circumstantially powerless, they nevertheless draw on the cathartic nature of lamentation as a mechanism for coping with grief. They have no other option. Hecuba herself acknowledges this when she tells the chorus, We can only beat our breasts in anguish, tear our hair, and that's all we can do. In fact, the first entrance of the women's chorus is in response to Hecuba's wailing. Hecuba, did you shout aloud? Or was it a howl of agony? How far did it carry? Through the walls we heard a sound that made us shiver in our misery. This frequent lamentation also gives way at times to the more elevated experience of song, which fulfills a number of functions for Hecuba and the women through the viscerality of sound and its physical properties. It is a rich mode of expression which voices their resistant stance, makes explicit what they have lost, signals moments of transition, and provides an experience of community that sustains and offers hope. Despite this new experience of a relativized status, overwhelming grief and personal disempowerment, Hecuba holds on to her former values in such a way that her dignity and integrity remain at the forefront. She is aware that others suffer too, and is particularly conscious of the women who will shortly join her on stage at the beginning of the Parados. Hecuba even refers to herself in a simile as being, quote, like the mother bird at her plundered nest. Unquote. Her empathetic qualities emerge across the play as being among her most commendable attributes. She weaves for her, quote, burning home, unquote, drawing on the relational connotations of warmth and affection which characterize her understanding of Troy at a very human level. For Hecuba, people matter, and none more so than her own people, whom she has sought to care for and protect. Hecuba may have lost her queenship and been relegated to the status of a slave, like all the other Trojan women, but her queenly qualities remain and her leadership is unassailable. Her resistance, compassion and courage in the face of adversity make her a remarkable leader and a symbol of hope for her people. Furthermore, Hecuba exhibits extraordinary bravery in the face of her captors, the Greeks. She refuses to back down or cower before them, even when threatened with violence. When Menelaus arrives, she stands up to him and orchestrates the proceedings against Helen, telling the king of Sparta that he knows nothing of the havoc that his unfaithful wife has caused for Troy. From a dramaturgical point of view, Helen's appearance provides Euripides with an opportunity to demonstrate an even wider range of Hecuba's extraordinary qualities. This dramatic exchange in episode 3 between Helen and Hecuba is a kind of rhetorical contest with a set of speeches common in Euripidean drama and known as an argon. The contrast in appearance between Helen, reputedly the most beautiful woman in the world, and Hecuba, now looking distraught and dishevelled, is striking to begin with. Helen presents herself as an innocent victim, shifting all blame to Hecuba and Priam, Paris and Aphrodite. Hecuba's vehement reply is a systematic dismantling of Helen's lies and obfuscations, which demonstrates at least three particular strengths. First, Hecuba is an adept rhetorician. Her arguments are logical, well-structured, and reinforced by a variety of conventions, including consecutive rhetorical questions and anaphoric structure. Second, Hecuba is passionate about justice and truth, vowing from the start to expose Helen's slanders, quote, for the rubbish they are, unquote. And third, Hecuba is courageous and forthright in making her own demands, in this case instructing Menelaus to, quote, consummate the Greek victory by killing your wife, unquote. In all of this, Hecuba proves that she is and always has been a worthy queen and leader of the Trojan people. Still, Euripides' characterization of Hecuba is not yet complete. We must now see her caught up unwillingly in the Greeks' desperate plan to murder the boy Astyanax. This is designed by the playwright to deepen even further the audience's understanding and appreciation of the most remarkable mortal on the stage. 
and to amplify the authorial concerns she emblematizes. In the plays unfolding, the Greek council's decision to murder Astyanax is announced ahead of the scene with Helen, but his dead body is not brought on stage until after Helen and Menelaus have departed. Fired with righteous anger, Hecuba holds the Greeks to account for the moral outrages they have committed, shaming them with her language. Oh, you Greeks, you are so proud of yourselves as fighting men and thinkers. Are you proud of this too? Why him? Were you so frightened of a child you had to invent this unheard of savagery? Turning from vitriol to tenderness, Hecuba then addresses the corpse of Astyanax. Her intensely human and compassionate side is manifested once again when she laments, quote, My little darling, what a wretched, meaningless death has been meted out to you. Unquote. During an extended monody, Hecuba continues to speak to the dead boy in an intensely personal tone, recalling the closeness and affection he showed his loving grandmother while he was alive. She links the boy symbolically to his heroic father, Hector, drawing on the presence of Hector's shield in which the corpse now rests. The dead boy and the captured shield suggest that the father and son are now reunited in the ultimacy of death and defeat. Ever practical, Hecuba then turns to the women, instructing them to find flowers to dress the body for burial. The speech ends with a philosophical reflection on the folly of human existence. Quote, Anyone born mortal and living in this world who thinks himself prosperous and secure is a fool. Unquote. A final point should be made about Hecuba's courage in standing up to the most fearsome opponents of all, the gods. By means of the play's prologos, Euripides has already established for the audience a cynical view of the gods as capricious, impetuous, meddlesome, and vain. Like all of her contemporaries, however, Hecuba knows that it can be well worth the effort to keep them placated and on side through prayers, offerings, and flattery. In the play's parados, she calls out to the gods in desperation, but clearly with little expectation of a positive response. O oh, you gods, where in my misery shall I go? What corner of the earth shall I burden with my old age, like a drone in the hive or an image of death still in the flesh? Later in episode one, after Cassandra has been taken away by the guards, she remonstrates with the gods and criticizes the foolishness of those who call upon them. Oh, you gods, what good were you to us? Betrayers! And yet people still call upon gods when bad luck or history has flattened them and the whole of their world has collapsed. But closer to the end of the play, physically and emotionally exhausted, Hecuba has despaired of calling on the gods and now attacks them directly, casting aside all fears of retribution or punishment from them, critiquing their indifference and asserting their irrelevance. Oh, you gods! But why bother to call on them? We called before and they didn't hear us. They ignored our prayers. Well then, why not run into the flames? Euripides shows us consistently that Hecuba inhabits her present moment with great nobility and humanity. She expresses her feelings with honesty and directness, and she takes on the awful circumstances of her world in a fearless and selfless way. Her empathetic nature is particularly evident in the tender words she addresses to her grandson, Astyanax. Clearly, this is a concern which extends also to the women and ultimately to their shared fates. Euripides' treatment of the future in the women of Troy involves an antithesis which contrasts fear against hope. The first exchange in the play between Hecuba and the chorus centers on the women's very real fear that they will be dragged away and shipped overseas to the homes of the Greeks. When Hecuba replies, quote, I know nothing but sense that the worst will come, unquote, she aligns herself with the vulnerability of her Trojan sisters while expressing the communal fear of an unspeakable fate. This fear then evolves into terrified speculation 
about the specifics of what this fate might involve. The women fear that they will be, quote, forced into the bed of some loathsome Greek, unquote, or become water-carrying slaves in Athens. As if shocked by their own forecasting, they then turn reactively to fantasizing about a more congenial future, drawing on highly romanticized descriptions of the geography and physical beauty of Athens, and eventually consoling themselves with the conclusion, quote, I'd be happy enough to live there, unquote. Sadly, this kind of hope is illusory and ultimately pernicious, though entirely understandable given the circumstances. When the messenger Talthibius arrives, he clarifies to some extent the issue of which women have been allocated to which masters, although he withholds information from the rest of the women until he deals with the problem of Cassandra. Now that Hecuba knows she is to become the slave of the Ithacan king Odysseus, her fears take on a much sharper definition. In my old age, I must go to Greece to finish my life as a slave. And what work will they give me, a woman of my years, to be a gatekeeper, looking after the keys, me, the mother of Hector, or a kitchen skivvy, kneading the bread dough? I won't sleep on a royal mattress anymore. The floor will be good enough for my bony back and wasted flesh. Hecuba continues at several points in the play to amplify her own fear and that of the women in relation to their futures, anticipating that, quote, the next horror will be worse than the last, unquote, or that, quote, luck always runs out, unquote. Yet in the play's final moments, she finds the strength to do what has become necessary in a spirit of stoic resignation. First, she must accept that Troy is no more and bid her treasured city farewell. Come on then, old worn out feet, make one last effort so that I can say my last goodbyes to my poor city in its death agony. Next, she must, quote, beat the earth, unquote, to signal her pain and protest. And last, she must lead her women into a future whose fear is lessened because of her presence with them, summoning up the strength to offer a glimmer of hope in a world of despair. Into the abyss. My legs are trembling, but I won't fall. Old limbs, strengthen yourselves. Your slavery is beginning. The women take their cue from Hecuba accepting an unknown fate with resignation and intentionality as they, quote, march down to the Archean fleet, unquote. While the situation in which the women find themselves appears to offer no real hope, the presence and example of their queen nevertheless does. Hecuba has stayed with the women throughout their trauma, fully aware of the intense nature of their communal suffering and caught up as much as any of them in an overwhelming fear of what is to come at the hands of their Greek masters. Hecuba's political and civic powers as a queen may have been taken from her, but her influence and benignity as a leader with real authority and genuine humanity are never in doubt. For Euripides, Hecuba epitomizes the experience of victimhood in war, showing us how profoundly devastating the consequences of conflict can become. At the same time, he also shows us a character totally committed to the task at hand, selfless in her relationships, honest about her feelings, courageous in her actions, and ultimately superior in every way to the flawed individuals who have caused her suffering and loss. Hecuba is a towering presence, ever the play's moral conscience and unmistakably its beating heart. Music